There, there we go. All right. So, hey, and welcome to A for Anarchy. I'm here with uh, Kyle. Say hi, Kyle. Hi. And Sergio. Hi. We're here to. Uh, well, I'm going to interview my guests a little bit, and then we'll probably try to discuss some basic issues. And uh, it will be the same show, half an hour. I'm going to start with uh, Kyle. So. Kyle, if you want to tell me, how did you become an uh, how did you become a libertarian uh, slash anarchist? Well, um, I guess the way I'd say it started was uh, I've always sort of had an economically liberal bent. Um, like even when I was a kid, I tried to start businesses in my home. I always had those grand schemes, and I think that was the first time I ever came across like regulations and things that bothered me because I tried to I tried to sell pretzels for my house and it was weird ask any of my friends they'll laugh at me for it but the point is that I did and then I found out that if I kept doing it they would shut me down because of course you know, I'm a kid you know making pretzels in my house that's not legal so after I found that out I don't know I always thought they ruined my business opportunity and uh, so I, I got more interested in economics and how to start businesses. And I think from there, I mean, I was probably 10, so I wasn't too economically literate, but it, it planted that seed. And I think from there, it more just became, as I became more politically active, I started out as a conservative. I was a big supporter of the Canadian Conservative Party, to my great shame now. Um, but from there, I think... Uh, well, I mean, it's much the same story, I think, with you. Uh, and then uh, when I came to, uh, what was it called, MSG, nation states, uh, and just that sort of political world opening up, um, I think as it went on, I was very much, as though, even though I was economically liberal, I was very strongly socially conservative, and you know, part of that is just the way I was brought up, you know, don't drink alcohol, don't do this, this is bad, you know, society is falling apart with all the sex and violence, we need to stop it with brute authoritarian smashing. And so, yeah, that was it was a pretty strong thing. I'm, I'm greatly ashamed of some of the earlier posts I have on that forum because there's stuff like, we should, I don't know, kill, peop kill drug dealers and whatnot. Now I'm thinking, like, I don't even want... I want drug dealers to be my neighbors and make profit so I can benefit as with the rest of the community. So yeah, it's it's, it's quite a change and I think the way it started changing is in part just because I met uh, folks like you on there, uh, like Sergey, Serge, uh, forgot, <laughs> forgot how to pronounce your name, it's all right. Um, uh, yeah. And I guess through that, I sort of began to see the political, uh, the side of it that I should be more politically liberal as opposed to economically liberal. And I think, I don't know where it started. I think in part it started once I changed my sort of social conservative position on gay marriage. I think that was the first shake in the armor, so to speak. Because once I started realizing how stupid I was for wanting to, you know, because I didn't like you know, the idea of gay people, therefore there should be no gay people. As soon as I realized that was ridiculous, I think the floodgate opened and I started realizing, well, I don't like drugs, but I'm not going to do drugs. It's fine if other people do them. And then from there, you know, really what's the point of, of the, the laws that put the alcohol, you know, or make it hard to acquire alcohol for people? Or other laws like that. Um, and I think from there it just, just more and more started filling up through the cracks until sooner or later I realized I'm a libertarian. All these things that I used to be against, you know, I'm socially and economically liberal. There's only one real term for that anymore. <laughs> and from there to becoming an anarchist is a bit of an interesting story because I, I remember fighting against it a lot. Because I think there was still a part of me, and there's still a part of me now that I I don't know if I truly can call myself an anarchist so much as I'm a voluntarist. 
because I do, I don't know, I, I've never been greatly convinced by the arguments for non-state organizations, but at the same time, I'm completely against what has become the state paradigm, and I want it gone. I want to smash the state. <laughs> so that I don't know exactly how it came about besides discussion with you fine fellows. Um, but yeah, we just sort of came came upon me one day that there was nothing in the state that I supported anymore. I didn't support the police, I didn't support the military, I didn't support you know universal health care, welfare, anything. So it was at that point sort of after this long drawn out battle that I realized there's nothing I see worth supporting in the state. Nothing that I think can be done by the state that can't be done better voluntarily, better and more morally voluntarily, which is really the important part to me. And I think that's that's where I am right now. I don't know if it if we can make it work, but I believe that we should try because the current system is immoral, it's illogical, it harms people, it needs to be changed. And I think it can't just be changed as some libertarians would say, you know, just by making it a softer state. I think we need a whole new organization to base society around and that that's why I turned to voluntarism. Oh yeah, cool. That's a good explanation. Now, uh, uh, I'm gonna try to get uh, make all my guests tell how long it took to go from a minarchist to an anarchist or a voluntarist, as you prefer to call it. If you want to try to get an estimation on the time. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess let's see. I joined joined NSG in 2010 as a conservative, and so yeah, four years, I guess. Uh, I think to become a libertarian took about six months on that site before I was really aware that my current things that I believed in were stupid and uh, maybe another two years before I really became an anarchist. I think this won't make sense to any of our viewers but I think once I sw the point is when I switched from uh, from the Adrian Empire, which is what my nation was originally called, to the merchant republics. And that was after I realized I couldn't support the idea of an empire. And I think that was when I first became, well, that was right before I became an anarchist. I think it was a couple months after. So around 2012, 2013. Yeah, right. Not uh, the rapid... Uh, uh uh, rapid change that you often hear in the joke, you know, what's the difference between a minarchist and uh, uh, a libertarian or anarchist? Three months, you know. But, uh, yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, before we go over to Sergio, I'd like to add that uh, NS or NSG, uh, what uh, the Ordination States is a forum where you can uh, uh, sort of simulate uh, a nation through role play or, uh, or just uh, be doing basic, you know, political discussions. Yeah. All right, let's go to Sergio. Now, Sergio, how did you become a libertarian, an anarchist? And uh, I would also, maybe you could uh, tell the viewers about uh, your upbringing in the USSR. Well, <clears throat> like Kyle, um, economically I was always pretty liberal, and I've told you guys this story back in the 80s when um, Pitestroika and stuff was happening in the USSR. Uh, businesses, they were all cooperatives, they're still, you know, socialist, but um, they were more or less private. People ran them, my father started one, and, you know, I was like a little boy, like seven, eight years old at the time, and I had my own little pretend businesses. I wasn't actually trying to do anything, uh, like Kyle selling pretzels or anything like that, so I was not shut down, there was nothing to shut down, but I always had the idea, you know. Um, and from there, came to the U.S. and was still economically liberal, but socially also, like I was, socially conservative. And um, if I saw something on the news, somebody did something stupid, I always had this idea that it must be banned. Oh, my God, that must be banned. People can't be doing stupid shit like that. And then 
you know, over time, it kept happening, and some of the things that kept happening were banned. Bans don't really work, do they? And um, so over time, and then also, you know, in my teens, I was doing some drugs and stuff like that, and obviously those bans didn't work. I was my own example. And, um, you know, we didn't hurt anybody. Nobody ever got hurt because of me. Um, and I just realized that it was pointless to try. And like pro like alcohol prohibition, it just didn't work. So uh, socially, I was still pretty conservative. Uh, this is kind of embarrassing, but um, there was a vote of a referendum in Virginia for gay marriage, and I voted no. So now it's embarrassing because, I mean, who cares if two people, what gender they are, you know, what sex they are. If they want to get married, let them get married, right? So, and then um, the bigger shift was, uh, it, it was interesting. Um, the housing bubble popped and there was all this economic turmoil and... This was 2008 or so. The election, uh, presidential, uh, the campaign was um, in full swing. Obama was saying, we need this and this and more government, basically. I'm like, oh, no, it's not the way to go. And um, everyone's solution was more government. I'm like, no. Yeah. And um, I was talking to one of my friends, and he's like, well, there is no pure capitalism. It has never been tried. It doesn't work. Blah, blah, you know, all the typical arguments. And then I started Googling pure capitalism, not aware of the term anarcho-capitalism at the time. This is, it might be after the election now, 2009, because my first nation was March 22nd, 2009. So then I came up on the book, Jennifer Government, which is silly. I don't think it's, the book describes it, how it would actually function. Regardless, I found the book and I found the website and I went from there. And uh, I guess by that point I was pretty minarchist. And um, the one thing that was holding me back between minarchy and anarchism was just fear of the unknown. Like, how would it work? What, you know, what if some tyrant took over? And you know, typical arguments that minarchists make against anarchy. But then it didn't matter anymore. It, it was, like Kyle said, it was a moral thing. You're still forcing people to do stuff. You're still taxing them. You're still taking their property. Um, you're still using coercion. And, you know, I'm, I'm not pragmatic anymore. It doesn't matter if it works or not. You just, it's just wrong to do it. You know what I mean? So... I, I would say it took me two or three years, but then again, you know, I'll, I'll watch a video by uh, Larkin Rose, for example, spent 10 years in Minerby, so that makes me feel better about my three years. Mm -hmm. My progress was a little faster. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, I have myself uh, described my travel in the political world down to voluntarism and capitalism uh, but I can recap it if you want uh, a deeper uh, a deeper picture you can uh, see my first episode uh, I grew up in a socialist uh, uh, social democratic household and I was sort of um, you know, indoctrinated into the views that are social democratic which is like a bit left of the Democratic Party in the US. But later I sort of realized I think this is stupid. I never felt comfortable being a part of the establishment, so to say. And I um, traveled to the right without being more liberal. So I became more economically liberal and moderate in my social views. And I just trailed down from there basically to. Uh, I was a minarchist for like not long. We're talking a month. I don't know, not not very long. I didn't 
I did not f feel comfortable taking the assumption that uh, you know uh, the government sucks, so we should have government in some areas. No, that was just bullshit. Uh, I want to go for, uh, with a new uh, question. Uh, I'll start with Carl again. Um, uh, how would you? What, what would you say is your method of bringing uh, a peaceful society or voluntary society? into the world today? Yeah, that's that's a million dollar question. I mean, I I can be a bit pragmatic at times. I'm sure you guys have noticed that where I'll as much as I am an anarchist, I will I will play the libertarian if it means, you know, getting the right policies passed. But I don't think that's a, a solution long term. I don't think we're going to arrive at a voluntary state at a at an end to the to the to the coercion and the violence of the current state through political methods alone. There's got to be another way, and I don't mean through violence. I, I don't want that at all. But I mean, there needs to be a shift in thinking, and I think even more so, there needs to be a point where we. Well, I think things like uh, well, you see stuff like seasteading, you see opportunities like the, the Free State projects, where groups of people go into these areas, and and we can do it piecemeal. I think to a certain extent, where we're talking about these small communities that become libertarian, that become independent from the state, and through that, we we can eventually convince more people that this this will work better. And it's going to be tough, and it's. It, it might even, you know, that we do risk a lot of, of danger just in, that the state will sense that competition. And I don't, I don't want to give the state too much credit. I think there's a lot of that. and it, it, There's almost a little bit too much of that, especially in libertarianism, where there's an element of making the state into a boogeyman instead of what more I see it as sort of like a weekend at Bernie's like cadaver that politicians move around very much, you know, it's force, but it's blind force. And I think still, though, when they see this competition, it's going to be tough, and it's going to mean that we're going to have to, we're going to have to, to fight. And I mean fight in the sense of politically, you know, through showing that we're the better system. And, yeah, so I, I don't know, I don't know how it's going to come about. I don't I don't know. I want. I want to say. And I've always, always sort of said this: that the idea of a velvet revolution would be the best, where people just decide one day it's it's gotten enough support that we can just say this doesn't make any sense. And I think it, it's been said before. You know, there's that there's that iconic picture of all of the of a, of the politicians standing on a platform, and the platform suspended over a cliff, and people are walking bit by bit away. And I think there comes a point where we'll be able to say, we'll be able to convince enough people to leave that that platform falls through and they, the state goes with it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think most libertarians feel that way. Uh, I do myself also. Uh, let's go over to Sergey, same question. How do we achieve anarchy? <clears throat> uh... I don't know. It's very hard. Um, I guess, you know, I, I do like those uh, ideas, like the Free State Project that Kyle mentioned. Uh, um, people, like-minded people, move to a certain area, and but, but they still vote. And I don't like voting. <laughs> voting, you know, uh, democracy. There is a good uh, article on... Uh, on Mises, um, how does democracy work, or how do elections work? How to win them, and you don't win them through good measures. You win them by lying, and uh, you know maybe areas like that, like New Hampshire, like the Free State Project, their elections might be a little more honest, but they're still elections. Mm -hmm. On the grander scale, you know, like in the United States, you win elections by promising targeting benefits and dispersing costs. 
you know, you have some program that's going to cost, let's say, $160 million, um, and it, it's funded solely by the income tax. That's an average of $1 per income taxpayer. Nobody is going to go up in arms and campaign against it for the $1, right? It's going to cost them more to campaign against it than they're going to spend for it. So they're not going to care. They're not going to do anything. The group that benefits is going to be a smaller group. They're going to benefit a lot more than their expenses to campaign for it, and the program is going to pass. It's going to get passed. And all programs are, you know, not all, but a lot of programs are going to have a similar um, for and against kind of, uh, you know, basically no opposition. So how do we achieve it? I guess get actual anarchists, not libertarians, to want to move to a certain area, maybe some island. Uh, you know, it's going to be expensive to like import stuff, but it's probably worth it. You'll save money on taxes, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, I'm outdoors and there's bugs. Um, But anyway, uh, yeah, I think moving to a certain area, island or not, I mean, all areas are run by state, so that's going to be difficult. But, I mean, even in the U.S., we have, like, so much land, population density, especially, like, in the Midwest and a little bit past that, like, the Rocky Mountain region. It's not very densely populated. There's plenty of land available. Why don't you let us try? Give mm -hmm. us a chunk of land, let a bunch of people move there, and live how they want to live. And I, I don't see that happening, but if they did let us, I think it would be a success. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, you know these events like Pork Fest and things like that, and people will do, you know, it's civil disobedience. They'll smoke weed. They'll have guns and shit like that, and nobody gets hurt. No, nothing ever happens. You know, people are just doing their thing. They'll listen to the speakers and they'll talk about whatever stuff we're talking about now, and they'll smoke some weed. They'll do something else. They'll have their guns with them, and that's it. Nobody gets hurt. There are no problems. So, maybe over time. I, I guess education is important. Things like this. Uh, get more people in the right mindset that uh, even if it does lead to good results, coercion is not good. So, just, you know, from a moral perspective. And those good results are still debatable at mm -hmm. best. And to me, it doesn't matter anymore, like I said earlier. Yeah, okay. And, uh, yeah, fine. Uh, Kyle, did you want to say something? No, no. Yeah, that, that mostly spoke to what I would, I would agree with him. I mean, uh, he brought up the fact that... Um, that Problems with things like in New Hampshire uh, and and free state projects like that is that it's still it's still what's what's the word connecting uh, communicating with the with the political process it's still voting it's still and ultimately there is a problem that democracy has that sort of sickness within it I mean I think you really get you've gotten to this point where I think there's been there used to be a concept that democracy was, you know, the worst system except all others that have been tried. And I think now you've got a lot of people that have internalized that quote, but not they don't understand what it means. You've got a lot of people that think, yeah, democracy is the worst system except all others that have been tried. Therefore, it's the best system. No, it's the worst system. 
it's a terrible system, and there really ought to be another way, but frankly, and from, well, we were trying to demonstrate here is another way, this one, let's try it. But people are saying, well, we've tried, we've tried kings, and we've tried, you know, I don't know, we tried Roman emperors and oligarchy and all these other things, so, I mean, democracy has yet to kill us all, so, yeah, still the best. No, it's still the worst, but we can't use the other ones either. And that, I, I have to agree with that. I have to say that, that is, you know, we, there is an element that we shouldn't be engaging in the political process because it's, 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 it's bad. Sorry, uh, I want to add a little bit to democracy. Um, I wouldn't call it the worst system. Um, it's definitely not the best. We know that. But uh, like I was telling you guys, you know, I have this coworker, and we were talking politics and stuff like that. And uh, democracy came up, and I said, I don't like democracy. And she's like, I'm not gonna mess on her name, but uh, she's like, why don't you like democracy? Well, democracy is still the majority rule over the minority, and sometimes it can lead to bad results. Sometimes. There's an understatement, but um, hmm. there are like examples. California voted for, I mean, against gay marriage, against recreational marijuana. North Carolina and Virginia voted against gay marriage. I helped that vote. This was a long time ago, thankfully. Um, so libertarians agree. Most all libertarians agree that. It's, not the business of the state, what people do to their own bodies or in the privacy of their own homes, but what business is it of your neighbors, the people you vote with, the people that vote for these things. It's none of their business either. As long as you don't hurt anybody, it's fine. So a, a democracy does not allow that. Mm -hmm. You still have, you know, conservative people, not only conservative people, but mostly conservative people voting for social policy, it's going to be the conservatives. But some other things, you know, like you have, uh, you have the liberals supporting the state for things like, you know, school lunches, like what food we eat, and or what food our kids eat, and Bloomberg banning large sodas and things that's ridiculous. I am. Uh, sorry, I haven't tripped you. Yeah. It's okay. Um, I bet a lot of people would support things like that. Like, oh my god, we're so overweight. And, you know, it's a problem, but I'd rather have a nation of fat people than, you know, a starvation problem. Mm -hmm. That's a better problem to have, I think. In any case, you know, it still leads to disease and stuff like that, but, um, well, speaking of democracy... And politics. I think um, we are fat because of the food we eat, and that's because of the stuff they put in it, and that's because of the farm bill, which is uh, probably one of the most bipartisan legislation pieces of legislation ever. Uh, you know, um, the 2000, 2000, 2002 thereabouts, the farm bill only had passed the Senate with like two or three no votes, which is ridiculous. It's almost unanimous. And as they say, this is a joke, but it's also true. Um, like they say, behind every joke, there's a little bit of the truth, or at least a little bit. Um, the most bipartisan legislation is the worst. So that's democracy. Yeah, democracy is definitely a problem. As you mentioned earlier, we have all these special interest groups who has lots to gain from uh, a certain bill, and then you have all the general public not losing that much at all from that bill. So democracy, democracy just leads to this vast expansion of state power, uh, mm -hmm. almost uh, in you know in the U.S., which is supposed to have a strong constitution, doesn't help. They just, you know, destroy it. Not that I am a constitutionalist at all, but there's no way to 
stop democracy from expanding and basically taking over more and more aspects of uh, people's lives. Uh, sure, there's some improvements, like in the U.S. when you have uh, cannabis and game legalization, but in general it just leads to uh, the state leeching off all uh, elder, all people stealing from each other in this weird twisted uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We don't have that much more time, but uh, does someone want to add something? Uh, well, I mean, since we are talking about it, it, it I think maybe I should just clarify. Like, I mean, uh, Sergey did sort of it's uh, search. Sorry, uh, you did make the point that um, the the policy uh, to say that democracy is the worst system. I mean, there are you know, it it's not perhaps the worst system, but. Um, yeah, when I do say that, I just sort of, I think, I think it was already elaborated on. Like, there are positive elements sometimes, but uh, I, yeah, I guess I just wanted to reiterate my point that even if it's not the very worst, it's still it's not. So bad. Good. Yeah, I mean, we can't. You've got people that basically worship democracy at this point. Where you, I mean, American school kids. I mean. People all around the world, the idea of spread democracy. I've never gotten that. I mean, spread liberty is what we want to do. Not not necessarily democracy. I mean, it might be better. It would certainly be better to have a free country in all respects, even politically. But when we are talking about spreading democracy, I always kind of just get tensed up at the idea because democracy doesn't equal good. Liberty equals good. And I mean... Whenever people are thinking of democracy, they're thinking of liberty. People don't want democracy if the Taliban are the ones that get elected. They want democracy because they want the social liberties and the economic liberties that they associate with democracy. But democracy is destroying those in the countries that are liberal now. So, I don't know, I guess that would be my final point. Yeah, all right. Uh, Sergio, do you, have, do you have anything to add? Not really. I mean, you know, from a state perspective, if we're talking about states, all right, so democracy, I guess, is better for the most part. Like the Western nations, Canada, the U.S., Western Europe, Australia, they do better than, you know, like China, mm -hmm. dictatorship, although they have been improving economically. Yeah. Um, through trade, um, <clears throat> trade benefits almost everybody, or it should benefit everybody, but the way China does it is wrong. But anyway, I digress. Um, what I was trying to say is democracy is not the worst, uh, you know, from a state perspective, but it's still a bad system from a liberty perspective. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, you know, your neighbor's banning things. And that's just wrong. Uh, if those actions don't hurt anybody, they should not be banned. And that's all there is to it. And democracy still uh, relies on a very coercive system to enforce those laws and collect collect taxes and you know property rights are violated and other rights are violated. So it's still wrong. He's so bad. Yeah, all right. Uh, I guess that's it. We're, we have run out of time. I just want to add that Sergio is the guy that you used to him in your case that helped me come to libertarianism. He's also the guy uh, that came with the question, who will build the roads? But it was not a he, he, of course, knows the answer to that. He's not stupid. <laughs> That, that was, was a no, joke question. I just had to add it, you know, just to fill out my show, basically. <laughs> so uh, we're done for now. Thanks, Kyle, Sergio, for being on. No problem. Thank you. All right. Thanks so, for having us on. You're welcome. Uh, I'll be next back next week, and uh, goodbye.